we were discussing this earlier that we are now nearly a year uh, doing this online. Um, this uh, platform has been very useful uh, during a very difficult time uh, with COVID and we've had many, many uh, sessions uh, and I'd like to thank Martin Mokler and say happy, a happy anniversary really um, in a year on really uh, to, to what we're doing. So Budget Explained today is um, doing what it says on the tin really. Um, there was a, a very important budget uh, last week uh, and what we want to do today is delve down deeper into the details uh, of that budget. Uh, you can ask some questions in terms of having any parts of that explained in the chat. And um, But I would like to welcome, before uh, we go into that, uh, Keith Tully and Gary Lee also. Uh, and the latter end of today's session, uh, we'll be talking about another relevant piece, which is insolvency um, and explaining um, the, uh, the detail of insolvency a little further as well. So back to budget explained, um, Martin. Last week uh, on Wednesday uh, was a very important time in, in a turning point because now we've got the roadmap um, and indeed we're hoping uh, to look at different dates of uh, releasing different um, structures that people will go back to normal again. Um, but the impact, I suppose, uh, what everybody was looking at is the cost factor uh, that, that this COVID challenge has actually put before us and, and how the budget has impacted in that regard. So uh, if you could, please take us into the relevant details of what happened last Wednesday. Sure. Thank you, Paul. And um, thank you, everyone. And thanks for having me back. So I'll, I'll give a brief summary of the budget because I can see that we had some questions beforehand and we have some coming in already. So I'll probably, uh, once I've finished my summary, I'll launch into questions, which will hopefully cover most of the main points uh, that uh, our Chancellor uh, explained. So the, the 2021 budget was um, Rishi Sunak's 15th major financial announcement since he took office. Um, he took over from Sajid um, Javid in February 2020. So it's hard to believe that he's been in the job for just over a year. So it's the, the all-time great baptism of fire. And the, the post-mortem after the budget was a little bit negative, um, partially, I think, coloured by the clumsy announcement of a 1% uh, increase for NHS staff, which didn't help things. Uh, I must say I thought it was a, a good budget, a fair budget. Uh, I think there was something for everyone. The um, real pain was kicked down the, the road in terms of future tax increases. Um, no increases in capital gains tax, which um, was sort of flagged beforehand that that would be a target. Income tax didn't increase. Um, tax thresholds and mill rate bans were, were, were kept the same as well. Um, so time, time will tell. There was an increase in allowances um, for um, individuals um, and the, the basic rate band was increased slightly, but that's just for this coming tax year, 21-22. After that, it'll be frozen for a number of years. Um, there's still some announcements in relation to the, the legacy furlough supports, uh, the, the uh, coronavirus supports, furlough being the main one. Uh, seed bills is officially ending at the end of this month, um, but it's been replaced by a new recovery loan scheme. And that's going to be effective from the 6th of April 2021. Now, that's a, a, a scheme where lenders can get a government guarantee of up to 80% of loans, so similar to seed bills, and it's for loans between 25,000 and 10 million. Now, if you've had a seed bills facility, then it doesn't preclude you from applying under the new scheme. So it really is a, an opportunity to further fund UK businesses, irrespective of whether um, they've drawn down existing supports. So I think I, I'll sort of pause there, Paul, if you don't mind, because I know we've got a, a lot to get through. It's only we're very an hour. We've got uh, obviously Keith and Gary coming in afterwards. So I'm happy to go for to questions now, if, if that's okay. That is okay, yeah. So um, one of the first questions we have is, we're a concrete frame subcontractor, and I've heard a little uh, about the new 130% super deduction. We are due to place a large order um, of, for plant this month. So can we benefit with these new allowances? So yeah, first of all, great name, super deduction. Um, and it really is a super deduction. 130%, um, other than R&D uh, sort of research credits and some supports historically for uh, remediation of toxic land, there haven't been um, very many allowances where you, you get more than the actual uh, spend on, on the asset. So 
the, the key point, I think, for, for that um, particular individual who, who asked the question is that um, if they're placing an order for plant this month, they should delay it um, until the end of the month because the super deductions actually don't start until the 1st of April 2021. So for the two years, from the 1st of April 2021 until the 31st of March 2023, any assets purchased by your company, you will get 130% tax relief for that asset. Now, unlike um, a, a sort of sister allowance, the annual investment allowance, um, there's no cap on this value. So in fact, Mr. Sunak, when he was speaking last Wednesday, his example was if a construction company that spent 10 million pounds on plant, they would get 13 million pounds worth of tax relief for that plant. So it really is an eye-watering scheme um, to be commended. Um, it is restricted to new assets, so new plant and machinery. Uh, that's a little bit different to the, the, the rest of the capital allowances regime. Uh, and obviously it's, 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 uh, the objective is to sort of kickstart um, significant investment in, in new equipment in the UK and increase productivity. Okay, and, and, and staying on the same subject, what type of assets qualify for the 130% credit? Like, I mean, do the likes of computers, large printer machines, website creation, all this kind of, what, what area do we qualify in that? Okay, so it has to be what they call a qualifying, so a new qualifying asset. So first of all, it has to be new. Qualifying is it has to be a fixed asset of the business. So the assets you touched on there, plant, um, equipment, um, computer equipment, um, there's some unusual, you know, solar panels, electric vehicle charging points, um, desks, office furniture, they would all qualify. Uh, website, um, partially. So the, 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 if you've got a website that um, is going to generate sales and, and, and web traffic, wherever you have said, you can claim um, the initial setup costs, you can't claim recurring deductions going forward in subscriptions. You can't claim any sort of planning um, or professional fees you might have incurred before you uh, set up the website. So servers, um, IT expenditure on creation of the website, they can be capitalized and claimed under the new deduction. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I own a property investment company and we're in talks with a national house builder to sell some options of land over the next few years. Should I be concerned with the further increases of corporation tax? Well, funny enough, I had an identical question to this um, during the week. Um, so corporation tax, the single probably biggest uh, change to the, the tax landscape, apart from super deductions uh, that was announced last week, is corporation tax is increasing from 19% to 25% from the 1st of April 2023. That's a 6% increase. That's a big number. It's not being tapered. It jumps from uh, 19 to 26, sorry, to 25. So for example, 25% corporation tax in the UK is twice the rate of um, the UK's nearest neighbor, Ireland at 12 and a half percent. So it, it, is a, it is a brave move, particularly when the UK are trying to attract foreign direct investment in the brave new post-Brexit world. Uh, increasing corporation tax wouldn't have been on the agenda um, pre-COVID, but it, it is now. So the question that your uh, gentleman has asked is about a land transaction. So what's key there is that that transaction ideally takes place on or before the 31st of March 2023, because on, on that basis, it'll be taxed at 19%. You'll suffer a 6% increase if it's taxed beyond that date. Now that's slightly different to say a trading business that might have a year in September 23, where six months of the trading year would fall into the new tax regime and six months into the old regime. Those profits would be averaged, divided by two, half would be taxed at 19% and half taxed at 25%. But for one-off transactions, the sale of, of, of land or an asset or capital gains within a company, which will also be taxed at 25%, there's a, there's a tax planning opportunity there for people to try and ensure that those one-off transactions occur before the 31st of March, 2023. Okay, and this next question applies to an awful lot of businesses, but in the context of, of this particular business, my, my company specializes in refurbishing hotels. And we have lost significant money over the past year, obviously. 
and my accountant tells me that I can offset the losses against future profits. Is that correct? Um, well, it's correct that he can offset the loss against future profits, but what's not correct is that he can't carry the losses back. So under the existing arrangements, um, pre this budget, you can carry losses back one year in any event. So what the Chancellor has done is allowed losses to be carried back up to three years. Um, I, and, and that is for any counting period that falls within the period one April 2020, so the beginning of lockdown, up until the 31st of March 2022. So that two year period, if you have losses that occur in that two year period, you can carry them back three years. Now this will impact on some companies that may already have filed tax returns for say the year ended June 2020. Um, that year end will fall in that period. So they, they may have to refile returns if there are significant losses. Um, so that is a very relevant question, and something that, that, that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, obviously, you know, if businesses lost money and they're still, you know, if they had enough reserves to, to manage through this period, they may have had some C-bills funding, etc. Um, and it's very important that they consider this and carry the losses back and uh, get some corporation tax refund from HMRC. And HMRC will be happy to do it. Okay, um, I operate a demolition company and we have still a number of employees on furlough. Does this scheme ex still ex uh, expire at the end of next month? Yeah, so the, the, the magical furlough scheme, it's, it's still alive and well. It was due to expire at the end of next month, 30th of April. It's been extended to the end of September. Um, remarkable scheme. I've said it here on this platform many times. I'll say it again. You just can't believe a, a Conservative government um, produced something uh, I like for out, out of the, the, the hat, but they did and, and they had to. So it's been extended. Um, so the, the rules apply until the, there is a change, however, up to the end of June, um, the, um, the, the company can claim back 80% of um, salaries up to two and a half thousand pounds a month. And that's for that, that, that there's a flexibility built in there. People can be working it's for, for hours missed. So it's for people who are completely on furlough at home or they're doing part-time work. So whatever their last income is, the, 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 the company can claim up to 80% of that salary um, to a maximum of two and a half grand a month to the end of June. So after June, the government are tapering that relief. So the furlough scheme is winding down. So in the month of July, it falls to 70%. And then for August and September, it falls to 60%. So again, you can see what's happening here Chancellor is trying to uh, avoid or prevent a cliff edge, trying to um, slowly withdraw the, the, uh, the, the furlough scheme over a sort of three month period, but it's alive and well to the end of September, albeit it's down to 60% at the end of September. And with reference to the furlough scheme, there was a mention back in November last um, of £1,000 per employee at the end of January. That seems to just disappeared and no one has made any reference to any replacement. Is that a fact or um, has there been something replaced that? No, it still exists. It, it, it hasn't been mentioned very much, but it still exists. And if you have uh, kept employees on furlough, it doesn't matter, you can still claim the, the scheme. It was an incentive to avoid companies making wholesale redundancies. So that, that's, that's a claim. Uh, we, ha we haven't actually seen the mechanics of, of it being refunded, um, but the, it, it certainly wasn't withdrawn, it still exists. Very good. And, you know, the fact that this furlough scheme has been expended, is, is that a t giving us a hint of what things are to come? Or is this roadmap irreversible, as we've been told, told by, the, uh, by Boris Johnson? Well, I think, you know, Boris has said this, it very much depends on the science. That they will be hoping, because of the remarkable achievement of the vaccination programme and, and the, uh, the falling numbers of so hospitalisations and, um, and mortality in the UK from COVID, the, the, the plan is to follow this roadmap. The scientists have built in um, sort of safety uh, locks into it that they, they'll make a decision three weeks after uh, a, a new step or a new milestone uh, on the roadmap. I think that's important. Uh, everyone has been, you know, it, it's fair to say we've been caught out a few times uh, um, over the last year releasing um, the sort of general population a little bit too early. So um, I, I, think, I think the budget ties in with the roadmap. I think these things go hand in hand. 
Um, there, there have been sort of you know, 700,000 additional unemployed people over the last year. They're trying to avoid that number um, increasing dramatically uh, over the coming year. Uh, you can see the supports are, are, are built in to try and manage this release and, and, and manage people returning to work. So, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm impressed. I've said it before, I said again, I'm impressed with this budget. I'm impressed with this Chancellor. I think it's a balanced, fair and balanced um, budget. And, and I think it, it ties in with, the, with the, the, the sort of reopening of the economy. Our company runs a number of pubs in London and southeast of England. So what is the position in terms of business rates for next year? Are we still closed um, until early April? So pubs can reopen for outdoor, I think it's from the 5th of April from memory, and then for, um, for they can reopen properly from, I think, 17th of May, mm -hmm. uh, my recollection, yeah. So, so the government has acknowledged the fact that they're not going to get um, income up to sort of normal levels until certainly the end of sort of Q1 uh, for them, the quarter end of June. So what they have done is um, the Chancellor has extended the business rates relief for businesses in the hospitality sector. So 100% business rates, no business rates payable if you're in that sector until the end of June. And, and from June onwards, then it's a 66% relief in business rates until the end of March 2022. So essentially, you're not currently paying any business rates. You won't pay any business rates uh, until the end of June. And then you pay two thirds of your business rates from, sorry, you, you pay one third of your business rates. You get two thirds relieved um, from the uh, end of June until the uh, end of March 2022. So again, tapering the relief hoping that hospitality reopens fully and that businesses won't need to rely on it come the end of the uh, well, beginning of next year. Okay, um, my daughter is purchasing a property costing 350,000, but the sale may not complete until the end of June. Does this mean my daughter will miss out on the stamp duty um, holiday for properties under 500,000? And what do you know about the new mortgage guarantee scheme? So, I just bounced back briefly to that last question, the previous question, Expo, if you don't mind. One thing that wasn't asked, was worth mentioning about the hospitality sector, is that um, VAT on uh, hospitality income is kept at 5% for the, for the time being. That was an extension that was announced in the budget just for anybody in the, the sort of restaurant or, or, uh, or pub game. And then it's going to increase to 12.5%, but still well below the 20% level for standard VAT rates. So just Worth mentioning that was lost. There wasn't a lot said about that, um, but for anybody in the sector, just to be aware. Um, sorry, back to that that uh, that question. So, um, yeah, the the um, so what's called the, the the SDLT holiday, the stamp duty holiday. So essentially, what what has happened is that the the, the nil rate band in the UK is one hundred twenty five thousand pounds. So that was increased to five hundred thousand pounds from June last year and due to expire at the end of March, 31st of March. So the Chancellor has extended that nil rate band at, at 500,000 pounds until the end of June. So that means anybody buying a property up to 500,000 pounds would pay no stamp duty, um, assuming that you're, you're, um, you're not buying a second home. You, you just pay the surcharge if you're buying a second home or investment property. Now, there is still a concern there's a, there's a significant backlog of mortgage applications in the pipeline and the lenders are saying that it's unlikely that if you if you haven't already applied for your mortgage you may not get your mortgage granted between now and the end of june so that's a concern for people who want to try and avail of this extension so the chancellor has um again trying to avoid a, a cliff edge he has said that the 500,000 nil rate band will expire at the end of June, but it will be reduced to a 250,000 pound nil rate band until the end of September. So again, tapering down this relief. So anybody who is trying to buy a house for say 250,000 pounds, if they can complete by the end of June, they pay no stamp duty. If they complete sometime after that date, but before September, so July, August, September, they'll only pay stamp duty on the element over two hundred fifty thousand pounds, so on a hundred grand, so it's still a still a still a significant saving, still worth pursuing. Anybody who's trying to buy a property, you know, 
if you can get a job at the end of June, then great. No, no SDLT on the first 500,000. But if it's between June and September, then you're still paying no SDLT on the first 250,000. So um, I think it's, again, a reasonable prop for the housing market. That's a key market for, for the country and for this government. Um, they've also, by the way, introduced a mortgage guarantee scheme just for your, um, your, 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 your gentleman's daughter, if he wants to uh, mention that to her. Um, the government are trying to encourage lending, sort of high loan to value lending, so debt between 91 and 95%. So uh, if you're a first time buyer, well, actually, sorry, not, not just first time buyers, which is different to some of the previous schemes. Anybody buying a property up to 600,000 pounds who wants a loan to value up to 95%, then the government are gonna stand behind that scheme. There are a number of lenders who have already announced they'll participate in it. So Lloyds Bank, Virgin Money, I think HSBC as well. Um, and the, the idea is to um, try and convert, as Mr. Johnson said, generation rent into generation buy. Um, but, you know, the, the government knows that the importance of the housing market, all of the spin-off, uh, economic activity, DIY, uh, solicitors, IKEA, uh, everything associated with, with, with house movement, uh, fundamentally important to the health of UK PLC. So, that, so, no, so that's, that's, a, that's a significant extension. Um, and the, the, the last SDLT to the Treasury pays in comparison to the increased economic activity and the increased revenue coming from the Exchequer. So again, to be commended. In terms of the deferral of the IR35, uh, that was kind of hidden away under the carpet for last year, has that now reappeared? Yeah, so I think it's fair to say most people assume that IR35 is going to come in and be implemented from the 6th of April uh, 2021. Um, we saw recently at the beginning of this month the domestic reverse charge uh, that had been deferred twice in the past and that, that was implemented on the 1st of March 2021 for construction activity. So I, I think it's probably a, a good working assumption that we're going to see IR35 being implemented. The only two things that are relevant uh, I think for, for the audience are firstly HMRC mentioned in, in, in the budget or the the Chancellor mentioned that the HRC have indicated that for the, for the year um, from April 21 to April 22, they're not going to levy penalties um, on, on any transgressions. They've also said they're not going to look back and, uh, and attack people who have perhaps decided that from April 21 onwards, they want to go on PAYE. So HMRC have said under those circumstances, they won't look at the previous years and say they should have been on PAYE in previous years. Um, and I think the other thing that's, that's important as well is this only applies to companies that are medium size or large. And that's quite a high bar for SME um, entities. So basically your turnover has to be in excess of 10.2 million and your gross assets in excess of 5.1 million uh, or only 50 employees. Two of those three tests need to be met. So essentially it's the same as the audit test. So if you're company accounts need to be audited every year, then yes, IR35 bites and it will bite from the 6th of April 21 onwards. But if, if you're below the audit threshold, then IR35 doesn't apply to you for the foreseeable future. Now, anybody who has, who feel they have an IR35 exposure, um, speaks to me offline because we may be able to assist. There are some planning opportunities in relation to, to uh, how you structure your, your uh, engaged um, sort of contractors, um, but that's uh, pretty uh, a different webinar and not for today. Good stuff. Well, it's still important. Uh, in terms of the VAT reversal uh, and the impact that we're hearing that that may have on the cash flow of subcontractors, give us a more insight into that possibilities. Yeah, so the domestic reverse charge was an attempt by HMRC to remove VAT from the supply chain in the construction industry, uh, essentially to limit the amount of fraud that, that um, happens in, in, uh, in the sector. Now, HMRC, um, the, their own calculations are that there's, um, there's up to 14 billion pounds worth of VAT um, sort of every year in, in the UK charged and 10% of that was missing. That's, that's, that's a lot of VAT. So, um, so what it has done is from the 1st of March onwards, unless you're the main contractor in a supply chain, 
then you don't charge VAT to your, your subcontractors above you. And so it has, it has, it has removed cash flow. Um, it is, a, it is a, an issue that will right itself and correct itself after a number of months. But certainly the first couple of months of so March, April and May can be uh, a real challenge or will be a real challenge for some businesses. A um, couple of easy, easy remedies. One is um, go on to monthly um, VAT returns, move from quarterly to monthly. That's, that's probably the, the, the simplest and easiest way to address it. If you, if you think you're going to suffer a cash flow problem, then let's get HMRC refunding money to you on a monthly basis, not quarterly. Um, I think at the moment, there's been a little bit of confusion in, in some corners of the market, but in general, I think it's, it's working okay. Um, the, the, the only elephant in the room is that HMRC, in their wisdom, excluded employment businesses and labour agencies from the legislation, which um, the mind boggles because um, the, the majority of VAT fraud in the construction sector happens in the labour agency uh, corner of the market. So it makes zero sense to me uh, to, to have that excluded, but that's power is greater than mine. I've made that decision and it's clearly about my pay grade. So um, uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, ca cash flow. You know, it 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 ha it's having an impact. I think people were aware this was going to come in, so it's being managed, and we've seen no real pain so far. Brilliant, Martin. Well, thank you very much for that insight, and that brings us on to uh, the whole area of insolvency. And I'm, and for a lot of people, the the word insolvency is kind of gives them nerves. Um, so we want to kind of dispel that myth now and give people uh, more of an insight. I'm joined by Keith Tully and um, <laughs> Gary Lee um, from um, Biggie's Trainer um, uh, Group, PLC. Uh, welcome, guys. And um, I will start by um, explaining what Gary does. Gary um, regularly acts uh, for regional professionals um, and, is, and is a specific expert in non-trading and non... Was it trading and non-trading administrations? Explain that to me, Keith. Well, that's Gary. That's Gary's description. So I'll let Gary Gary explain that. I do. I do understand where you're coming from with that. Though. Go on, Gary. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. And thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I'm a licensed insolvency practitioner and a chartered accountant, and uh, I deal with all formal corporate insolvencies, i.e., liquidations, administrations, company voluntary arrangements, compulsory liquidations, anything that has a corporate a company angle I tend to deal with. Um, uh, the personal insolvency is also dealt with in Begbie's trainer. I don't specialise in that. So if I have anyone who's an individual, I get my colleagues involved and I concentrate on the companies, which itself is a specialism. Um, I mean, Begbie's trainer is 31 years old this year and uh, a national practice with 80 offices, 830 staff and 85 partners. And that's before we took over CVR Global early this year and a large acquisition. So we have a great global and uh, international and national reach across what we do. Um, what we've seen in 2020 is quite a shift change in the insolvency landscape. Within Begbie's trainer, we have access to a lot of data about companies and how they're performing. And something we look at on a quarterly basis is the red flag alert statistics. And uh, they give us an insight into what UK PLC is doing on a regional and a, um, a specialism and a sector basis. And when we look at quarter one to quarter two for 2020, we look at the level of distress. So we take information that's publicly available from the company's house, from the courts, etc. And we look at those companies that are in significant distress. So i.e. those companies with CVA, CCJ is less than £5,000 or deteriorating um, financial accounts. And what we saw in 2020 is that the, the movement between quarter one to quarter two was an increase in distress of 3%. And then when we mapped it again from quarter two to quarter three, it had increased to 6%, just as the, the pandemic was settling in. But as and when we look from quarter three to quarter four, we saw a massive increase of 19% of distress in UK, which says that pressure is building up within the UK and the SMEs in the UK. And one of the major factors of that is possibly to do that, as we've seen over the 12 months, is a reduction in turnover 
because companies have been mothballed or reduced turnover, but they've taken on more debt. So a deterioration in their balance sheet position, which has led to that massive increase, which is now 665,000 companies in significant distress at the end of quarter four in 2020. When we look at the insolvency statistics, and these come out quarterly and they also come out monthly now during the pandemic. Normally we have around about 16 to 17,000 corporate insolvencies a year. And in, in, in 2019, there were 17,225. When we look at 2020, the number of corporate insolvencies was 12,557, a reduction of 27% across the board. Now that's quite a significant number a reduction in insolvencies and one well, of the main reasons we've seen for that is is the government initiatives which have been put in place at the moment there is an embargo on statutory demands and winding up petitions being issued and that's in place until the end of march so no company can be wound up for covid related reasons um, so the number of compulsory liquidations they they've fallen absolutely significantly across the 2020 period We've also seen a, an embargo on wrongful trading provisions for directors, which is in place up to the end of April. Now, it doesn't give directors a get out of jail free card. Uh, it does, they still have their fiduciary duty that they've got to comply with. But what it does do, it takes away the pressure of them basically making the decision to trade on, when by they thought, well, should I trade on, should I not trade on? They don't want to be found guilty of wrongful trading. This has taken away that uncertainty so it's given directors a bit more um, protection of trying to trade through the pandemic, which is what the government are hoping to achieve. We've also seen embargoes on landlords' uh, rights for forfeiture. Um, and coupled with that, we've seen the, the, the furlough scheme, which has now been extended to the end of September. We've seen C bills and B bills um, to be replaced by the recovery loan scheme. And of course, we've seen HMRC deferrals so all of that put in place, we've seen a reduction in formal insolvencies um, because there is no catalyst. The director, he's got no one chasing him at the moment because the people can't wind him up, the landlord can't distrain. Um, no one's going to um, appoint under a debenture at the moment because there's, there's no point to. So we've seen insolvencies fall, but what we are seeing is this pressure building up within the companies by trading on through it, possibly continuing because the furlough scheme is in place, but they've still got overheads to pay. They've still got rent to pay, rates to pay. At some point, there's going to have to be actually a way out of this. So what we're looking at, at the moment is whilst the government in the budget say extending the furlough scheme, which was the right thing to do, we're looking as an industry to say, what's it going to do with stat demands and wind up petitions? Are they going to extend that beyond the, beyond the end of March? Wrongful trading beyond the end of April? What are the measures that are being put in place to try and have this tapering, soft landing, unwinding of UK PLC getting, getting back to where it was pre-pandemic? So I think at the moment from a, an industry, we're all watching and waiting to see what's going to happen as we come out of this, this pandemic. Okay, we have a reference in the whole insolvency world of a zombie company. Could you please explain a zombie, a zombie company to me? Yes, uh, it says that the zombie, as, as, it's, um, as it said, like, it's like the living dead. It's like a, a company which is just about clinging on to life. So pr prior to the pandemic, we were uh, talking to a number of directors and we had uh, liquidations lined up and we were helping companies. And virtually overnight a lot of those companies didn't need to do anything they didn't need to put their company into liquidation because there was no one chasing them so we've seen over the last 12 months a significant number of companies which were possibly insolvent before the pandemic have managed to survive by the skin of their teeth effectively through the government support measures but they haven't got any better and they've possibly got worse by taking on more debt just to fund losses and uh, fixed overheads. So those companies, when the pandemic 
is eased and the restrictions are eased and the government support is eased or withdrawn, they will be insolvent and they'll have to do something about it. They are being kept alive by the government support, which is what it was intended to do, to reduce unemployment, reduce redundancies, uh, reduce companies failing and assets being, asset values being reduced. So they've been kept alive. Um, some, rightfully so, they've done okay. They've gone off and changed into different markets. They've explored different uh, industries and uh, some have actually thrived in this. But there's a great deal that have just sat there and mothballed, which are going to have to be dealt with as and when we come out of this pandemic. So in a sense, with the extension of the Furnham scheme, we could in fact be just masking over the problem of the zombie companies. I think at the moment, say, say the furlough extension was the right thing to do. I think we're in the middle of this pandemic. We've got a lot of, um, a, a few, few months yet, whereby we've got to come out of this. But underneath that is this issue of these companies which need to be cleared out. Now that, that could be a, they just need to have a negotiation with their, their stakeholders. They, they can informally manage their way out. If there is forbearance um, and some debt forgiveness, they might be able to trade their way out of it. They might need a more formal arrangement, i.e. a company voluntary arrangement, which is a, a, a horse trade effectively between the company, its creditors, to pay them something over a period of time. It might need something more formally. What you might need is the hole that's there to fill the debt hole might be too significant. So they may have to go through a more formal insolvency, i.e. an administration or a liquidation. And it, it depends what you've what you dealt with on a case by case basis. We see a lot of companies and they say, what are the options? And we say, right, OK, well, depends where you are on that scale. And we get brought in to do a lot of options reviews ranging from the there's no problem what you're talking about. I don't know why I've been brought in. You're, you're asset rich. It's not a problem. All the way through to you've got too much debt. You've got no cash. And there's a catalyst, i.e. You, you've got to deal with some, some creditor is chasing you, um, but you've got no assets. So compulsory liquidation might be the right answer. And anywhere in between. And these companies, as they're coming out of that, will need to know what their options are for them. And by seeking advice early, and getting a licensed insolvency practitioner or a bit of restructuring advisor in, um, we'll look at all sorts of outcomes from the good to the bad and anywhere in between. And the sooner that is started, I wouldn't wait until September when the furlough scheme ends or when the, the, the mechanisms get reduced. It's net like, start planning now. Start looking at it now. What can you do? What, what, what have you got available? What, what's out there to help UK PLC and each business actually survive and then thrive when it comes out of it. Can I just add on that, Paul, just to jump in? That's why we've launched at Begbys the director advice line, the national director advice line, because there are a lot of questions that directors need to ask, which are tricky questions they need the answers to. They need to know where they stand legally on matters. And we found we did lots of these types of webinars and advisory sessions and people didn't want to ask questions and give the names, et cetera. And you can understand that. So by launching this director advice line, we're finding we're getting a lot more inquiries, lots of different types of businesses, but with the same type of problems, what they've, what they've done with money that they've received, whether the business is viable moving forward. And I think Gary's spot on. What we're trying to put over to business owners now is get the advice now, Get whatever finance packages you, you, you can as a result of what's happened from the budget. If you need them, only use money that you need and prepare for the future. But get the advice now and be armed with, you know, from an advisory point of view, with, with the legal position that you will be in once um, once the will resumes. OK, in, in your viewpoint, then, Gary, have the civils and bounce back loans achieved their aim in providing support that's needed? I think when we came into this, and I say it's interesting you started this, Paul, saying it's 12 months ago when we all decided that we had to work from home and learn how to turn a computer on in a spare room. And I think the government acted really quickly in getting these initiatives out there. And the amount of funds that have been put out via the banks and the funders um, with the government guarantees in place has been absolutely phenomenal to support the businesses in their hour of need. So having the 
ability to get either a bounce back loan or a C bills or a CL bills has been absolutely brilliant. I think um, it's helped those businesses that needed to survive actually manage their way through this. However, I think the big but in this, I think a lot of the funds that were put out were put out possibly to companies that didn't need them, um, but just wanted them. Well, why wouldn't you? Because you know, you've seen a lot of it was free money. Uh, it's got to be paid back at some point. Um, but if you can have it, why not um, take it? I think the other thing we've seen, we've seen a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence about potentially um, fraud has crept in. And I think the government are quite um, hot on that about looking at bounce back loan fraud, um, furlough fraud, etc. So, so it's from a, from a professional advisors, one of the things we're looking at is when we look at companies, we say, right, how, how was it spent? Was it spent correctly, etc. Because we have our own reporting requirements which we have to report on the conduct of directors. And one of the things that's come into the fore is furlough and bounce back, et cetera. So I think the, the funding the initiatives that are put in place were excellent and were the right thing to do. My concern will be is about the recoverability of some of those loans and the mechanisms whereby the lender has to go through to enforce or collect before it can call upon the, the government guarantee. And I think it will be interesting as we come out of this when the insolvencies um, start coming back um, and we start seeing them with bounce back loans etc and C bills um, how it unravels how what's the outcome how they get repaid and again it'll be interesting to see the statistics when they are published about the amount that gets repaid back to government or how much gets reclaimed on the government support initiatives so I think where we are is the right place but as anything is the devil's in the detail and it's easy to lend money it's getting it back to the problem and i think it's uh, how we how we get out of this and unravel that that will be the interesting times and in terms of the um support measures when they're eventually withdrawn uh, will we see the predicted onset of insolvencies and if so um what level do you expect them to be at uh, that, that, that's a very interesting question that paul because again Everyone's expecting this wave of insolvencies. As we've said, we've seen pressure build up. Uh, we've seen insolvencies fall to an uh, absolute massive low compared to the last few years. So there's this pent up pressure and demand. But again, it, it, it depends how we actually come out of this. And I think one of the things everyone's going to be looking for as a bit of guidance is the Crown, HMR, HM Revenue and Customs, because traditionally they're the largest creditor in most insolvencies through their um, the PAYE, the VAT, the corporation tax that's owed. So what level of support is going to be afforded there? And of course, don't forget that they um, changed their preferential status on the 1st of December last year. So rather than ranking alongside all other unsecured creditors now, they're actually ahead of that tree. They're a secondary preferential creditor behind employees, but ahead of the unsecured creditors and ahead of the floating charge holders, the banks in certain circumstances. So it's going to be interesting to see how they actually unravel and what support they give, because I think they're going to be quite a good barometer as to how stakeholders treat um, companies that are in distress. And as I said, you can have informal workouts where everyone works together. You can have formal ones through CVAs and um, our trade body, R3, have put together a, a COVID-19 CVA um, template for companies that need to come out through help because of the pandemic. And there will be those. But the, the, the issue we're all looking at to say that with this pent up pressure that's built up, you know, and I think the one question no one knows the answer to, is it going to be like a balloon that pops or is it going to be like a balloon that's got a, a hole in it and it sort of like unravels slowly and I think everyone's going to be watching and waiting to see the roadmap that gets put in place for the measures we talked about about stat demands why not petitions government support HMRC's attitude so I think there will be there have definitely been increase on 2020 but as to what level that is and how much that is will very much depend on I think the support that's afforded to businesses coming out of this.
And finally, you know, we spoke about the, the helpline that's there, uh, but what other options uh, will directors and stakeholders have available to them to navigate their way through the effects of this pandemic? Uh, so one thing we do see is that the, the earlier we are involved, the more options there are, without a doubt, be that talking to your accountant, talking to your lawyer, talking to a restructuring advisor, talking to an insolvency practitioner, whoever, the, the sooner you take professional advice, the more options they are. And at Big Biz Trainer, whilst our name is synonymous with insolvency, we don't just do insolvency. We do a lot of other uh, work around helping companies survive, helping solvent outcome. We saw a massive increase in the demand for our services for helping with solvent liquidations prior to the budget. As Martin said, everyone was watching and waiting about um, capital gains tax. It didn't materialise. But a lot of companies and owners and managers came to us to help them liquidate their business solvently to then have a capital distribution for themselves. So we saw that. The other area we see is where business come to us and say, look, I've got a problem. I don't quite know what my problem is. Can you just set out all my options available to me from the very good to the very bad? So we'll go in and look at a company and we'll do options reviews or exit planning or strategy, exit strategies, just to say to the owner manager and any key stakeholders that are included in that, be that the bank, the asset-based lender, the invoice finance company, the asset finance company, the landlord, the pension creditor, whoever it is, we're going to say, okay, right, what have we got? What are we dealing with? Okay, there's a cash shortfall. What can we do about that? There's, there's losses built up. What can we do about that? There's an underperforming asset. What can you do about that? There's a group here. You don't need one part of the group. You can sell that. If you sell that, you get the cash. You can invest it somewhere else. And we work very closely with our corporate finance team, our corporate solutions team, looking at fundraising, our debt advisory, our forensics team, across the whole of Begbie's trainer group, where we have not just insolvency, but advisory. We have charter surveyors. We have all these different disciplines which can be brought in to help an owner manager and, and directors and stakeholders look and say, right, this is where I am. Where am I going to get to? And how am I going to get there? And it's building with them that, that plan, make sure they have the best chance of survival. And I think we're on uh, unprecedented times. And I said to my staff, they, they, they take, take nothing off the table. You know, there's this complete blank piece of paper. We've got new um, tools in our restructuring kit now with the moratoriums and the restructuring plans that came in last year. Working with all our key, key advisors and in-house and externally, how can we help this business get to where it wants to be? If we can do that solvently brilliant, if we can't do it solvently, what's the best way to work our way through that? And we look at that across all of the options available and it gives them that roadmap and that plan. And what we find with owner managers is that sometimes they're they're too got much in the detail. They can't see the business. So taking a step back, getting a professional advisor in to help them can actually give them that idea of how they can actually work through this. And actually, it's like a breath of fresh air to a lot, lot of them because they can see a plan. Brilliant. They can, okay. they can but, uh, they've talk to someone. That's great, Gary. And thank you very much for your contribution in that because I'm sure this will become a, a useful um, piece of information to all our better members um, across the nation. And uh, I'm delighted to mention also that Keith Tully has actually become uh, a member of the Manchester board. So you're going to see him a lot more and uh, we'll be rolling him out um, on beta um, a lot more regular. So uh, thank you both for your contribution. Finally, um, to go back to Martin uh, and give us the last hurrah, um, you know, we, we've had so many measures, Martin, um, uh, now in, in, in the, uh, the budget. Um, do we expect more interim uh, messages coming out during the year or is that the plan and we're going to follow the plan accordingly? Yeah, really good question, Paul. If we consider that Mr. Sunak was on his feet 15 times announcing financial measures during the, the year to, uh, to date, be hard to see him not standing up again until March 22. Um, I, I don't know. I think we'll see a, a autumn statement. Um, I think if you recall, they had a, the government had decided the autumn statement would take place in the autumn every year, and it would it would be combined with the budget. Uh, that, that obviously changed because of because of uh, circumstances. 
Um, I think, look, I think it, it depends on, on how the roadmap um, plays out. If, if there's a requirement to extend furlough or a requirement to beef up some other measures, then he'll, he'll have to come back in. Um, it, is, it, is, it was, you know, 2020, 2021, the, the year to March 21, such a fast moving year that, um, you know, they, they reacted when they had to. I think the same would be true again. I, I would hope we won't see him having to stand up again until March 22 because it'll mean that the plans have worked and the roadmap has been adhered to. So uh, on, on a positive note, I think it's fingers crossed. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Martin, again. Uh, and uh, to the guys, uh, Gary and Keith, uh, thank you too. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, for coming to join us today and getting the budget update. Uh, we'll be seeing you soon on the Bit of Platform to give you any updates going forward. Thank you and good evening.